Nathan Voss is with us today. This guy is such a gem. He is a filmmaker, photographer, writer, and he balances all of that with his love for another profession, public transit. Nathan is a bus driver for the city of Seattle. I say this later on in our conversation with him, but the fact that this episode even exists is a perfect example of what resonant bravery, AKA secondhand bravery can do. Because Nathan came to us by way of a listener of the show, Christy, who is a member of the storytelling scene in Seattle. She saw what Nathan's been up to, recognized it as the kind of bravery that we talk about here on the show, and she reached out to me. It's pretty simple. You just send me an email. (laughs) I knew that if Christy thinks someone displays bravery in their life, then I had better listen up and lean in. And you will agree with her like I do, especially after you listen into today's conversation. In the initial email she sent me, Christy described Nathan by saying, and I quote, he's a 31 year old Metro bus driver who's been doing it for about 10 years, who purposefully takes the hardest route. And he also does storytelling, photography, writing, and some film stuff. She says, I don't know him well personally, but he's always a bright light at the show and around town. He'll find something positive in anything, it seems, and is always ready with a hug and a smile. And she sent me some clips to some of his work that's on YouTube, which those clips are now in the show notes for today's episode. So you get to experience the same thing I did when I was like, yes, we need him. We need to show him to you guys. So today, Nathan and I talk about the crazy stories and intimate exchanges that happen between participants in a public transit situation. We chat about what it's like to have a day job or a side hustle that seemingly has nothing to do with your real hustle. We also talk about the small, tiny changes that serve as the invitation for bravery in a given moment. And we talk about comfort zones and how to put yourself out there as an artist. So you'll definitely want to listen in to the whole thing because there's lots of good stuff in this one. Please join me in welcoming the beloved Nathan Voss. You're listening to Bare Naked Bravery, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Emily Ann Peterson. As a singer-songwriter, author, teaching artist, and creative entrepreneur, I encounter some really fascinating stories. I'm on a mission to reveal the depth and width of bravery and its benefits to creatives like yourself. More than ever today, our world needs bravery, unique bravery from everyone. This is the place where you find it. There is no script or censorship today because that's how these facets of bare naked bravery are in real life. So if you're listening with little ears nearby, please know that some episodes may contain mature language and subject matter. One of the easiest ways you can share bravery with the world is to send this episode to a friend or two. Send them an email, text, or tweet. Tag them in one of my Instagram posts. My handle is Emily Ann Pete. Or leave us a review on iTunes. It takes seconds and can be done from your phone right now. Again, we need more bravery in the world. So let's be brave together. Are you ready for bare naked? Some bare naked so ready? ready. Yes. Bare indeed. naked bravery. Okay. Uh, Nathan, you are here with us. Hello. Nathan Voss is here, and he is among many things, because this is what we're going to start talking about, is what it's like to be a human Venn diagram. You and I have a lot of things on our business cards, basically. Indeed. You know how some people have, like, one side of the business card is one thing, and the other side is another thing? Uh, Yeah. We would need, like, a... Uh, uh, Yeah, a three-dimensional, yeah eight-sided octagon whatever card yeah we would need like a a D and d dice with <laughs> like <laughs> multiple exactly I, yeah so nathan is a filmmaker he's a photographer he's a writer he's sometimes a painter and he's also a record holding bus driver you're very kind <laughs> um you know something about this that, that's coming to mind is I like hearing how my different friends will introduce me to their friends because they'll usually only mention one or two of those. 
And I like hearing which ones they choose because it's like, okay, they see me as this. And usually when I'm with my artist friends, they'll be like, Nathan's a bus driver. And then when I'm with my bus driver people, they'll be like, Nathan makes movies. You know, it's always, this is what he does besides what we assume. Right. Well, I, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was why are, why bus driving? Mm -hmm. I mean, I get like the, <laughs> like the, the filmmaker, photographer, question. writer, sometimes painter, those things kind of belong yeah. to each other. There's like a through line there. Yeah. Right. There's the art line, right? Mm -hmm. But why a bus driver? Great question. Okay. So I think it has to do with like a shared fascination with people and human nature. And that's what brings the fascination with the arts and humanities in with bus driving. I didn't know that when I started though, I had this like, since day one, I've had this child fascination with buses. And I imagine that's sort of a corollary with how like little kids like dinosaurs and stuff and other objects that are larger than them, such as monster trucks. And for me, buses, totally. But over time, the reason to love transit shifted. As an adolescent, it became this a bus pass was analogous to a library card because it was this like open window into a whole new world that you could explore. And as an adult, it's an opportunity to learn about and connect with other human beings in a meaningful way, even if for a short time. And because I have, I have wondered about, you know, I'm driving down the road and I'm like, okay, why do I have this enormous passion for driving the bus, which is almost as large as my passion for making art, if not comparable. And, and yeah, it's because, both of them involve human nature, learning about people whom I love. When I was a child, I was this super shy, you know, I liked animals, and it gradually turned into this thing of, I really love people. And I can't imagine a job, I don't know of any other jobs where there's a wider spectrum of humanity I get to interact with on such an intimate scale. Okay, so I grew up, just as a background, yeah, please. of my experience with public transportation. Uh -huh. I grew up in Atlanta, which is where wow. I currently am right now. Okay. And in Atlanta, we have the MARTA, which okay. is, and we also have, like, fingers of bus routes and things like that. Mm -hmm. But generally, it's, public transportation is not a thing that's Different done in the, in the South especially okay. it's like in the south it's not and in texas which is where i spent like high school college area yeah. time absolutely not there is no public transportation um wow i mean there is but nobody uses it right doesn't yeah. run often enough doesn't yeah run and enough. i think you know in texas part of that's because everything's so spread out mm -hmm. that you might as well just drive <laughs> <laughs> um so when I moved to Seattle is really interesting. You know, I had friends who were very much avid users of public transportation and I moved there from Texas wow. being like this, like full time, all the time drive myself kind of person. Right. Yeah. And this, the cultural shift from it's radical. It's it. Yeah. It's, but it's great. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a way of like, I feel so much more that I'm part of the city when I'm riding the bus as opposed to driving through it in a car. And I think there's something valuable about riding the bus, especially for children, because it gives them an opportunity early in their life to be close to all the other ways of living life, not putting a value judgment on those, but just like there's more than one way to negotiate through this universe and riding the bus offers you visual, I don't know, data of that. Yeah, it was very helpful for me. Okay, um, so let me ask yeah. you this. As Please. a bus driver and an artist, mm -hmm. who are your favorite type of passengers? Okay, great. So we can choose which bus route we want to drive. Okay. And I choose the one that does, it does Rainier Avenue and it also does Broadway. Okay. Um, at the same time. It's the 7 and the 49th and they, they turn into each other. And Broadway is a bunch of like, you know, younger, good-looking, liberal, left-leaning, progressive people who tend to have an awareness of arts and culture. That's great. Rainier Avenue is closer to my childhood in South Central LA. It's a bunch of, I hate generalizing, but, you know, here we go. It's, it's a bunch of working-class, multicultural people who like, just say un they understand and appreciate love 
Mm -hmm. Um, But perhaps because they don't receive it all the time, especially from authority figures. And getting to like be a loving presence in that realm is just enormously satisfying. And so in response to favorite passengers, I choose that route combination because it's, there's something electric about these two groups and there's an energy on Broadway. There's an energy on Rainier. They're quite different from each other, but yeah, spending time with the working class probably reminds me of my childhood and also feels way more satisfying as like, okay, it's useful that I got out of bed today to serve transit dependent neighborhoods. There's, and yeah. and I, th- I feel like that beautiful blend. Mm-hmm. It's like an, it's a nice cultural ombre. It is. It is. I benefit from both. I like driving down Rainier Avenue and hearing everybody speak different languages and constantly being reminded that smiling like is so universal and cuts through all languages. But on the other hand, I love being up on Broadway, having these erudite conversations with, you know, grad students or teachers or something, or just residents in the neighborhood. And that's just as satisfying too. So I, one of my very favorite cello students when I taught cello lessons Uh um, did a bus route. Uh And because I haven't talked to him about the fact that I'm doing this, I'm not going to mention his name. Sure. Just because I don't know. I don't want to like invade somebody's privacy unwillingly. Mm -hmm. But he had so many interesting stories. Sometimes not all of them good. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And yet... There was a season where I was like, oh my gosh, I need to pay the rent. And he was all about me jumping on board and being, becoming okay. a bus driver. And I was so close to doing it. Like wow. I was so yeah, close to doing it yeah. because it is a great job. And I think I would love to know what you think about having bridge jobs, side hustles, mm-hmm. and like mm-hmm. time off from quote unquote time off from being an artist. Okay, that's a great question. I want to briefly supplement my my previous comment about Broadway and Rainier Avenue. Yes. There is overlap there where I will have just as intelligent of conversation, obviously, this goes without saying, on Rainier. There is a moment where we were we were driving the routes and I thought it, we, we, there's just a few people on the bus and we all thought it would be fun to turn off the lights inside. And so it's pitch black in there. It's the middle of the night and we're driving up the street. And I mean, did you just propose this to the group and say, hey, what would it be like? I think I started the route without the lights on and I had one guy on board, this uh, homeless gentleman with one eye who is extremely awesome, who often rides my bus and we have these long conversations. And we started off the route with, with no lights. And then we got a few more people and they thought it was cool. And I would ask them, you know, I can turn the lights on. Do you want me to turn the lights on so you can see? And they're like, no, this is way more exciting. <laughs> and later on, we were, we were talking and talking about books and literature and culture. And a gentleman who had been the, on the bus that night came on another night to tell me, that he was so blown away because he doesn't usually ride the bus in Rainier Valley and he happened to get on and the bus didn't have any lights on it. And there's this like really weird mix of people. And we were all talking about like Emily Dickinson and and, like high literature. And he was really blown away to listen to my homeless buddy talking about like Milton versus Shakespeare and which one made a greater contribution to the English language. And he was sharing how like it expanded his understanding of homelessness and you know yeah okay and it's, back, yeah. Uh, unless yeah. it's strange <laughs> like it, it's it's not strange it's completely understandable to me uh-huh. that by just turning off the lights doing mm-hmm. something really simple but mm-hmm. that is out of the norm brings people pe- together it got yeah. people to get out of their own comfort zones and to interact with each other definitely and so i think so you know necessary you know when you're trying to be brave or when you have a moment of like this yeah. feels awkward yeah sometimes just doing something strange like holding your mm-hmm. keys in the other hand or wow. you know like like something really simple and mm-hmm. seemingly harmless just by switching like drinking your coffee with the other hand sometimes oh, that wow. is I enough that. to get your brain to go how could this be different or how could my situation yeah turn out differently something that subtle yeah 
Yeah. Well, I'm turning off the lights is not quite subtle depending on but, what time of day it is, but sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think I just had to, before you continued, I had to mention that, that like, please, yeah. there's this like really simple thing that was like mm-hmm. the instigator. Wow. Isn't that cool? Yeah. It is great. It is great. And I love it when people do feel comfortable, old enough to be vulnerable, to start talking with each other and stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. Your question from a moment ago. Yeah. Remind me briefly. Who are your favorites kind of passengers? Right? Was that the question? We go on there, rabbit trails. I know. Here. Yeah. That's there, there, there was that. And then. Oh, side hustle. That's what we were talking about. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so there's this ad that's on the sides of buses. It's, it's two pictures of me. And in, in one, I'm dressed as a photographer, and the other one is a bus driver. And it says, uh, bus driver by night, photographer by day. And I'm actually not sure in that ad campaign which one they think is the side position. Probably the bus driver job. But for me, it's I'm not really sure which has a greater share of my identity. I like to think it's evenly bifurcated. But I think it's super valuable to, okay, two small examples. The architect John Young said that being a bus driver is the best job for an artist to have. And I imagine he's referring to the amount of life experience you are witness to. I was at a Q&A with Philip Glass, the contemporary classical composer, over at Town Hall. And Philip Glass was doing this Q&A session because he's just written a memoir. And everybody was asking him these really boring Q&A questions like, what inspires you? Do you ever get writer's block? You know? <laughs> and this grad student got up and said, Philip Glass, what advice would you have for a grad student in music who wants to like make it in the world of music? And Philip Glass sat there and thought about this for a while. And finally he said, an answer which I don't think is what the student wanted to hear, but he said, get a job, preferably not in the arts, such that you have total creative control over whatever you're doing and recognize that, that like why you're making the art. Like we make it for ourselves, you know? It's about what the art does for us. And what I love about his answer was that it implicit in it was the idea that it's not important how many people buy your art or look at it. And this is something I've run into with, I had a wedding photography business for a number of years. I no longer do weddings because there was something really constricting about having somebody else controlling my, my artistic output. I much more prefer going and spending time on the bus, getting inspired out there, and then being able to do whatever I choose artistically, getting into galleries or fine art shows and so on, rather than environments where you've been hired to create this. You, you, you know what I mean. And well, I mean, not- it's like, okay, so some of my, yeah. we talked about this, or mm-hmm. Amber Hawken and I talked about this a little bit on yeah. an interview that she did of me for her podcast. She, oh. was also, she, was also on, she was also on the show too. Anyway, yeah. so she and I were talking about the season of life that I had just after I got diagnosed with my hand tremor and I had like basically tapered off all of my students mm. and was left there with like, how am I going to pay the rent mm-hmm. now? What do I do? And I got a job working, working with one of my friends who was a manager at a local tanning salon. Okay. And that was, first of all, I hated it. But right. yeah. so that wasn't the right day job for me. <laughs> However, yeah. I will say I saw a very unique group of people that I would have never been never. able to witness or experience as an yeah. artist. And, you know, having a set list of tasks as mundane as just folding towels. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was so that that provided me the, the, the space that I needed to actually grieve Mm-hmm. and recover from this, you know, diagnosis and what am right. I going to do with my life kind of situation. I didn't need to know what I was going to do with my life right that moment. I needed to have time to yes. just like not do anything. Sort of breathe. And I needed, I needed to wipe down. Hands. Yeah. I needed to wipe down some tanning. <laughs> boots. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. Also, I have to say that driving the bus has contributed so much to my understanding of people and like I had had interactions with homeless people before but not a lot you know I didn't have long conversations with them or see them every day for years and I just I didn't have a very wide awareness of people and I'm so thankful that this job as you mentioned like allows me to hang out with a 
social spectrum that's so much I would never get to hang out with these folks otherwise and I would feel so constricted in my like artist friend group which I can now see is pretty limiting I didn't think that beforehand but yeah I'm so thankful to have all these other folks what have you so what have you learned about your art specifically Mm -hmm. from these people that you see on a daily basis yeah great question a couple things come to mind they they help me see life through eyes besides my own, you know, and that informs the art so that it's not so, I don't know, self-absorbed or limited in perspective. In terms of heroes, I remember driving the 358 down Aurora Avenue once and I was listening to these two guys talking and they appeared to be on the more down and outside of things. And we got to Denny and Aurora and the one gentleman said to the other, this at that intersection is where I lost my legs. I was crossing the street and this Mercedes drove its bumper into the area right below my knees, which is where the bumper of a Mercedes is if you're standing. And he was explaining that like, that's where he lost his legs. And he had a really good attitude about it. And I was so humbled because it's like, okay, these guys know way more about how to be happy than I do. And there's so much, so much I can learn from them. And just, I'm so thankful to be out here on the streets, driving around in circles. Yeah. Does, I imagine some of your art and work has, I mean, obviously been very much influenced by these people. How have you noticed that? Like in ter- with respect to photography or? Yeah, whatever. Writing on the blog? Yeah. Wow. That's and is I it, love this and question. It, I don't, and is it intentional or does it happen and kind of surprise you? It happens and surprises me. It's without my thinking about it. I love this question because I have not been asked it before. Oh, yeah. Um, when I am that's, taking, my, that's my specialty. <laughs> thank you, Emily. <laughs> um, when I'm taking photographs, it's all about like trying to feel the space wherever it is, you know, if it's a new environment like I'm traveling, and then trying to capture that emotional feeling. And that's more important to me than capturing the physical reality of whatever the place looks like. And that's a pretty internal process. In terms of how I could apply the expansion of awareness from bus driving to that, it would be sort of not like concrete, you know, ephemeral at best, but I imagine it does contribute in the sense of expanding my, the, the feeling, the ability to think about other lives and and i'm not just some i don't know tourist who's not thinking about what you know what does ordinary life feel like in this corner of the world maybe i think that from having driven so many other folks around their ordinary lives from day to day We'll go back to the conversation here in a quick second. But before we do that, I want to make sure you know about the Bare Naked Bravery Facebook group. It shouldn't have surprised me, but I was so pleasantly elated by how warm and welcoming and wonderful all of you are towards each other. And I think I just forgot briefly that people who do brave, bold things on a daily basis, they aren't as scary as their feats of bravery might seem to me or to somebody else. You see, when you join the Bare Naked Bravery Facebook group, you're invited, not required, you're invited to share a picture or introduce us somehow to your unique bravery. These new member introductions are total day makers, and not just for me, for the other members of the group. I know this is true because I've seen it happen over and over again. It happens every time somebody new joins us. So please, hop over to Facebook, search for Bare Naked Bravery, and get ready for a great big internet hug of inspiration from inspired people doing really inspiring things in the world. I don't want you to miss out on any of it. Do you travel much? I know this is like a complete diversion. Of- I love traveling, yeah. Okay. It's- yeah. When you travel, what mm-hmm. is your, like, what goes through your mind? This is just because I'm curious. This has nothing yeah. to do with bravery. I'm just yeah, curious. Yeah. <laughs> when you travel, how do you experience other cities' transportation? Okay, yeah. I feel like I haven't really experienced a city until I've gotten on their transit. Yeah. Because so, then you can really, like, be there with regular life. And I love traveling alone. I tend to travel alone. And I like just throwing myself into situations and countries where 
I just don't know anything. And it gives me new appreciation of the folks on my routes who don't speak English because buses are intimidating. They're more complicated than rail or train services. And it's really difficult when you don't speak the language. And having been in that situation tons of times, it's a great learning experience. I'll tell you this story. This yeah, is like, yeah, please. This is, okay, so I spent a semester abroad in Turkey, in, and uh-huh. I went to the Middle East Technological University, or UD2, in Turkish. Cool. And in Turkey, they don't have, like, designated... Well, they have routes, but they don't have, like, designated times at which the buses appear. Oh. So it's okay. just... They just... They call the buses dolmushes. And dolmush oh, is okay. Turkish for a stuffed pepper. Wow. <laughs> because so, it's so full? Because... Basically, the dolmush will jam as many people as possible into oh the truck, into the van or into the bus, uh-huh. and then won't leave until everyone is stuffed in there. And so if you're waiting at a, bu- at a stop and the dolmush is already full, it's up to the bus driver to determine whether there's more room or not enough room, and they may or may not pick you up. Oh, right? my goodness. Right. So then, then you have to just kind of like be like, well, I'll get the next one. And living in a foreign country has a lot of culture shock. And there's like, it, there's the three day, the three week and the three month culture shock oh, wow. that ends up happening. At least for me, it's, it happens like that. And I was at like the three month mark wow. with with this culture shock. And there was a day where it was like, nothing was going my way. And then this freaking dolmouche pulled up and they wanted me to like get on the bus and at that point I was in the back of the bus but by the time the my bus stop happened the dolmouche was full and I had to like elbow my way out of it and I just let out a string of American cuss words <laughs> and just said get me the fuck out of this bus <laughs> just screaming and everyone was looking at me like oh my gosh let her off. Let her off. <laughs> I was going to ask, yeah, how do you get off the bus? You and just the- have to, you have to, like, make a way for yourself. And the American test where it's come in handy. Yes, yes. Because, <laughs> well, and, you know, I, I'm sure it didn't help because they have their own interpretations of what Americans are like. So. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so I just think, you know, my, my experiences yeah. of being in various transit mm-hmm. situations in different places are like each city has its own cross section and its own yeah. color palette mm-hmm, mm-hmm. within the transit systems. Mm-hmm, yeah. But I imagine being a bus driver, you have a different interpretation of that. Well, Seattle's interesting because the, because so many of the different class groups use transit. I forget if it's 70 or 80% of commutes downtown involves something besides single occupant vehicles. And most of that is bus and rail. And so you do have these routes that are like the 218 coming in from Issaquah Highlands, you know, the express to downtown is entirely like people in suits and suitcases that are worth more than their paycheck, you know? And I like that those folks use the bus as well. You know, it's uh, uh, in Los Angeles, my hometown, uh, that's much less the case. People think of LA as a driving town, but that's because the people who use transit is everyone else. And uh, there's a lot of people who use transit, but there's this other huge group of people who never uses transit. Here, like it's it's just there are situations where you don't want to drive like southbound I five in the morning. Like you really want to be on a bus during that because it's faster. The bus lane. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm grateful too. Although in my, again, my experience of Seattle is as a cellist. So I'd awesome. have to, like, if I were to ride the bus, right, I have to lug around a cello. Yeah, um, that dramatically changes it. Yeah, it does. Yeah. But, I, you know, every time I would use a bus with, and got on the bus with the cello, it was like, oh, is that a guitar? Oh, like, there, <laughs> it was like, there's, there was, it was like having an object out of the ordinary yes. and bringing it on the bus was an invitation. It's like turning for, off the lights. Yeah, exactly. It's it, an invitation for people to converse and talk and yeah. have a good time. So and sometimes I'm sure you wanted to have your own quiet time, but other times it's so great to have these conversations you wouldn't otherwise have had. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's really it's important. I think it's important for 
I think it's important for any citizen to get a little bit outside of their comfort zone and experience their city in a different kind of way than they normally do. Definitely. And thinking about uh, comfort zones, yeah, there's, especially for kids, like if we only ever show stuff to kids that's within their comfort zones, like they're not going to learn anything. And it helps to like push that envelope just a little bit. Having said that though, I like respecting other people's comfort zones because, you know, they have their reasons and I don't want to step on those. Totally. Now, okay. So let's talk a little bit about that because respecting other people's comfort zones is a little, has a little bit to do with this three layers of bravery. Okay. So are you ready? Here we go. I'm so ready for the three layers. The first layer is internal bravery. And that's the kind of bravery that you like, for instance, you finally admit to yourself that you need a divorce. And then the second layer would be talking to a friend that would be an external bravery and saying that out loud to someone else. I see. The third layer of bravery would be resonant bravery. So if someone else was watching you tell your friend, hey, I think I need a divorce, and they thought that was inspiring or brave, that's resonant bravery. So I see. So there's this like subjective layers of (laughs) bravery, right? Where you may not think that what you're doing is very brave, like turning off the lights, but maybe right. somebody else, maybe another bus driver thinks that that's like, a f- what a great idea, you know, or like, what a terrible idea yeah. or whatever. You can think something. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, okay. So have you witnessed anything as a, you know, have you witnessed any resonant bravery or yes. third party bravery? Yes. Secondhand bravery. Secondhand bravery, my favorite. Um, okay. Wow. Okay. What I love this. I love this way of demarcating different types of bravery in part because it links to something that I really believe, which is that the positive impact we have on others is always going to be larger than we are aware. You know, there's always going to be somebody across the street who appreciates something about you and they're not going to say so. Secondhand bravery. I like being on the bus and like, so I say hi to every single person who gets on the bus and that establishes this sort of, friendlier living room type of vibe, you know, it's my mobile living room. And I like seeing people using that as like a springboard to then be, it alters their attitude. I can't take credit for their actions, but I like to think that like I'm making it more safe or perhaps more of an idea to, for these two like hoodlum looking children to help the old lady with her bags off the bus you know, or do things that I don't often see on other people's buses, but people like going out of their way to be helpful or looking up something on their phone to help somebody else who's lost. And I like watching that transpire. I'm having trouble thinking of specific examples, but I'm, I'm going to keep thinking about secondhand bravery okay. about this. Yeah. I know, I know that those moments of that secondhand bravery mm-hmm. end up, they kind of sneak up on you. Right, because it's usually the moments of like, ah, or yeah, yeah, oh, that is so cool. And then there's, yeah, there's times when I'm blown away by how generous and how kind people can be. This job makes me love humanity, you know. And I hope uh, other bus drivers would say that sentence as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have there been any moments where you were like scared of or for or? Mm -hmm. something sure yeah definitely and I noticed something like when I first started especially first started driving downtown I remember being told by a driver like they're they can tell you're brand new they can just smell that you're green so what I tried to do was pretend to be confident and what's crazy about that is pretending to be confident eventually turns into real confidence I don't know how that transition works, but it does. And how did you pretend to be confident? By trying to show through body language and tone of voice that I wasn't afraid. And sometimes, yeah, in situations where someone is trying to be intimidating to myself or others, yeah, if I just take that in stride and continue speaking in a friendly voice, you know, confidently, with confidence that can really help things. And that's how I try to behave when people are fighting or something or, you know, something is like 
simmering and maybe about to blow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've talked about this before on the show, but Beyonce has a Sasha Fierce. I don't know if you are aware of this. No, but I want to be. I know. So, (laughs) so Beyonce uses like an alter ego of herself. Okay. She gets on stage. She's Sasha Fierce. I see. Good name. Yeah. Yeah. How do I not know this? Wow. Cool. Yeah. I, you know, and like just now thinking about it, I'm like 90% sure it's Beyonce. And I really need to look that up. I really need to look. No, I trust you. Like she's the queen. We need to make sure that she's. Yeah. Appropriately credited. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit more about your art now. Okay, like, please. Like, I wanted yeah. to, I could talk about bus stuff all day long. I could talk about anything all day long, yeah. I also <laughs> love the fact that you do art. You, you are a storyteller. You engage with your non-bus driving, non-bus driving life in a very artistic way. So, first of all, you guys you have to listen to his story on YouTube about the cats. It's so hilarious. There's, can you describe it a little bit before Um, I ruin it? For sure. Uh, (laughs) The, the setup is that I was asked to house sit in an extremely expensive apartment. These two cats were by far the worst behaved cats I've ever experienced in my entire life. And I'm not a cat person. And it was one thing after another of these like amazingly inquisitive and excited cats doing what I think are adorable cat things, which were profoundly annoying to me and kind of dangerous and <laughs> difficult to address. It was pretty great. <laughs> it's awesome. It's like a 10 minute story that you tell. And, and it was at the Fresh Ground Stories in Seattle, yeah. right? Is that correct? How often do you do that kind of stuff? in terms of storytelling. Yeah, I, I'm almost always there every month, but I only rarely tell stories. And other people have told me like, yeah, you need to only tell really good stories because all your stories have been really good. And if you start telling them all the time, that'll dilute their quality. And you should just come in like, you know, a few times a year and tell something amazing. And so maybe that's what I need to do. But yeah, yeah, I've told a few stories there, most of which are online on YouTube and from my blog as well. But it's so satisfying. I love public speaking. I love the, like bus driving, uh, (laughs) telling stories in front of an audience involves a very small margin of error. And there's something- Wait, 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 wait. Because I'm, I like to think that, I like to think, it sounds funny. I like to think that I'm a terrible storyteller because I always like, I I feel like I get in my head and then I stop Mm -hmm. the storytelling process or like I- I do that too. Okay. It's scary. Yeah. And so as a story, so at Fresh Ground Stories, as I think you know, like we cannot use notes. It has to be eight minutes. You have to have the whole thing memorized. And that's exciting to me because it's hard for me. And I have to spend a lot of time memorizing them. And I like pace back and forth in my living room here in a space that approximates the space of the stage at Fresh Ground Stories. And I'm holding like something that is like similar to a microphone so that I, the uh, body language feels comfortable. Because I want to get it right. And same thing with, with driving, especially the electric trolley buses, you know, with the poles on top. Like, you just cannot screw up or else everything gets destroyed. And I like that excitement. <laughs> yeah. That sounds terrifying to me. <laughs> it's really fun. And maybe that's something that's so satisfying about the interactions on the bus as well. Like, you really need to be on your A game. And it forces you to be good. Kind of like shooting on film. Like, it just automatically makes you a better photographer. Smaller margin of error. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, I love, I love getting on stage and sharing what I know how to share, which is, for sure, which is music. And I, you actually touched on something really important when you're attempting to do something brave Mm -hmm. before you've done the thing. Mm -hmm. It will help if you could recreate the moment as best as you can. Yeah, as best as you can. Because practicing not in the moment, Uh how to be brave requires that you have to try to duplicate every element of spot. Definitely. Yeah. And I think, you know, and there are a lot of public speakers out there who don't practice holding with a mic, holding the mic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like even just holding your phone as if it's a mic. The little things. Yeah. So helpful. It helps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe your, 
your films and your photography okay, yeah. and yeah. your blog and all mm. the other awesome stuff. I feel like life is this thing that we can never grab onto. And it's, that's part of the texture of it. It's elusive. It's continually happening. And we're always trying to grab onto it by way of documenting it. And there's a push pull relationship between do we experience life or do we document life? And as an artist, we try to express ourselves and things about life that we observe. And it is in part the act of trying to document life. And that's what I'm attempting to do with all of these things. The synergy between them all is they involve trying to grab onto that moment and write about it so I can recreate it for another reader or photograph what it felt like to be standing in this corner of the world because uh, it was so beautiful. And the art piece never, it's always just an approximation. It never, it never fully captures the act of having been there in that interaction or experience. But it's, I think it's worth trying because even if you can get half of it across, it's worth it. And life is so rich and dense, but also light. It's hard to grab onto. And all of this art making has to do with trying to share that beauty with other people. It's, it's just everywhere and it bowls me over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have two follow-up questions or two, fi two final questions. I need a pen to like keep track of your questions because I okay. love all of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the first one is for all of the other artists or mm -hmm. creative types out there who are trying to put themselves out there. What advice do you have for them? Because your even just your like experiences with galleries uh -huh. and putting on shows of your work, like that stuff that some of my artist friends have not delved into yet. True. Um, who they might want to, you know, but what, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for them? Okay. I love the question. So I've noticed that what I tend to do, I have done the thing of like trying to apply to this, this, and this and not getting in and trying to apply to these other things and not getting in and then finally getting into something. There's that process, which we've all heard of, but there's also, I think what's really important to do is to not compromise your own art in the act of doing that. It's important to just continue to be yourself. I, there's a friend of mine, uh, uh, Chris Acasiano, the, the experimental jazz drummer, local drummer here, makes this music that is definitely not mainstream, but he's been pretty successful at it. And I like that he just, he doesn't narrow down what he's doing on the hopes that a large amount of people will like it. The filmmaker Steven Soderbergh was saying, and with, with respect to filmmaking, you've got to make a film you would like. Because if, that, if you do that, there's a small number of other people like you who will enjoy it. If you try to make a movie that you don't like, but that you think everyone will like, there's a possibility no one will like it. And if you just continue to make the art that you like, it'll resonate with someone. My father is a book mender. He mends old books. No family. way. That's the coolest. Isn't it the coolest job ever? And he's, I've been doing it for years. And I know of nobody with less of an interest in a public media profile than him. Like, you kind of be less concerned with stuff like that. But like, New York Times just did a article on him in the A section of their paper and somebody just made a short film about him. He's been on local film and television here and like print magazines. And it's not because he tried to put himself out there, but because he was being himself authentically. And which is a form of putting yourself out there. That's quite true. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. And I, um, I tend not to do gallery shows these days unless people approach me for them. And I think that's because I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to, I don't know, just absolutely be myself. And when a friend recommends a show to me, I'll apply for it. But I feel thankful to be in this position. And before this position came to be, it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty frustrating. Who's going to, who's going to like this stuff? Someone will like it if you're liking it. And You've just got to keep making your own stuff. David Lynch, the filmmaker, his first film at when he was going to school at AFI was Eraserhead. It took him five years to make. Totally idiosyncratic, avant-garde movie. 
that couldn't have looked appealing to distributors at the time, but that that's exactly what he wanted to make. And it developed this like midnight cult following, you know? And yeah, if you just keep being yourself in your art, uh, it'll resonate with someone. Mm-hmm. That's the best I, answer. I fully I stand by that. I fully stand by that. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so then the second question is, yeah. what advice do you have for us in how we can be brave within our own communities? Wow. Okay. I feel you, like... you have this unique, like, perch in the, mm-hmm. in the especially the Seattle community, right? But, uh-huh. but you have this perch. You can see the community from a different angle than that nobody else can. And I'm sure you have an insight? Well, I feel like in interacting with this wide, vast group of people, people have so much more in common than they don't have in common. And you can trust that in your interactions with people, even if they look or talk or behave differently than you do, there's going to be way more common ground than there isn't common ground. And that can be sort of a nugget of information you carry with you as ammunition for being bold enough to be vulnerable, which is how I describe, define bravery, and bold enough to be yourself and honest and straightforward Mm -hmm. around people. And yeah, people have so much in common, you know, we're all going for approximately the same things and like trying to be happy, uh, trying to achieve our own version of happiness and find love uh, in different ways. And yeah, and yeah, answer the question a little bit. Yeah, Yeah. it totally (laughs) does. It totally does. This has been so fantastic having you on the show. I'm really, thank you. I'm really glad this worked out and I have to give a shout out to Christy. She's fabulous. She's fabulous. She, um, she is a listener of the show and she suggested that you come on the show. And so if any of you guys have anybody else that you know of who has their own unique perch, to look at brave situations, then I welcome the suggestion because if people like Nathan can come out of the woodwork from something like that, then that's awesome. And I, you are, this episode itself is a representation of resonant bravery because Christy, some, you know, for obvious reasons to me, yeah, she thinks you're a very brave person. And so oh, she suggested gosh. you for the show. How cool is that? It's wild. <laughs> yeah it there is it's, but, it's, yeah. but it's awesome so um you know if you I, my challenge to you guys is if you see somebody who is being brave make an extra make an extra effort to notice that or to tell somebody about it because especially if you tell somebody about it if you tell somebody about the bravery that you just yeah. witnessed then that bravery becomes bigger exactly than even you forward. thought it would be Yeah, I'm going to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Emily. It's been a real pleasure. Your brave takeaway from today's show is to do something quick and harmless that's a little outside of the norm. And that doesn't have to necessarily be outside of your comfort zone, just outside of the normal pattern that you go about life in. This could be texting someone with your other thumb or holding your keys in the other hand or turning the lights off on the bus or wearing a different color sock on your left foot than your right foot. Something small. I think you'll find that even those micro acts of change might inspire some other things to happen too. We would love to hear all about your favorite parts of today's Bare Naked Bravery. No, no, really. Nathan, Christy, and I, and the rest of the Bare Naked Bravery listeners are waiting for you to join us in the Bare Naked Bravery Facebook group. We've got a lot of really, really cool things happening, and I want to make sure that you get to be part of that. Other than that, though, you can also find Nathan, Voss, and myself on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more, and just go ahead and tag us so that we can cheer you on and see what you're up to. Plus, all of those links to the stories and clips of Nathan's work is waiting for your curious eyes and ears in the show notes for today's episode. Go to barenakedbravery.com and search for Nathan, and his episode will pop up 
for you. Easy peasy. That's our show this week. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as Nathan and I enjoyed making it for you, then please give us a review and rate the show in your iTunes desktop app or on your podcast app on your phone. It really does help us out a lot. So the bravery that you hear today and in other episodes on the show, it deserves to be spread as far and as wide as possible. So even if you don't leave a review, I encourage you to share the episode with somebody who you think would enjoy it as well. If you're digging the music in today's episode, that is because it's brought to you by my friends at Music Box Licensing, a premier creative music agency dedicated to finding and crafting unique soundtracks. To find out more about all the artists, musicians, and other sponsors of the show, please visit barenakedbravery.com forward slash sponsors. I'm so looking forward to being with you next week. We have some awesome things in store for you. Until then, I have one message for you. It's this, be yourself. Be brave because the world needs more of your bare naked bravery.